Hello, this is Austin Wintry. Welcome to another remotely recorded composer edition of the Game Maker's Notebook. Today I had the incredible joy and honor, really, of speaking with composer Gustavo Santalaya, known, of course, to the industry and to gamers everywhere for his music on The Last of Us Part 1 and 2. Those are the only games he's worked on, but we still managed to talk about his career in general, which has spanned many decades and all manner of, of different endeavors, and about the nature of art and where we derive inspiration. And, and the conversation went a bunch of different places. It was a genuine joy. We had never met before. Um, and by the end of it, uh, I felt like I understood him uh, quite deeply. And so I, I can't overstate my gratitude uh, for having had this conversation and to Neil Druckmann specifically for encouraging that it happen and setting it up. So uh, I hope you enjoy it even half as much as I enjoyed participating in it. Welcome to The Game Maker's Notebook, a podcast featuring a series of in-depth one-on-one conversations between game makers providing a thoughtful, intimate perspective on the business and craft of interactive entertainment. The Game Maker's Notebook is presented by the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, a member-driven organization dedicated to the recognition and advancement of interactive entertainment. Maestro Gustavo, <laughs> let's let's get one thing out of the way first. You probably have the most mispronounced name of all time. Correct. I, I I've heard a hundred different attempts at pronouncing. Yes. I always say Santalaya. Very good. Very very close. Very Isn't very. A, the only oh, thing is the, the diphthong. You have to do Santaolaya. Santao. Tao like. Santaolaya. Yeah, Santaolaya. This perfect. Perfect. Uh, well, that's good to know. That's slightly reassuring because I, I, I hate butchering those things and being oh, so yeah, cliche yeah. American. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have some I'm, stories with the name, as you can imagine, you know. Well, it's, yeah, because it's, I, I'll, I'll, I'll come across interviews and things over the years and it's, you know, please welcome our guest, Gustavo, Gustavo Santa la 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 la. No, no, and no. I, I always think, well, I think there's a couple too many syllables in there. Yeah, I, well, I you know, I tried to explain, I said, listen, it's like Santa. Santa Monica, Santa, you know, Santa, Santa, Anna, Santa, hola, 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 Santa, hola, yeah, Santa, hola, <laughs> Santa, hola, yeah, you know. That's or an excellent like, tutorial. Yeah, or like San, San Gabriel, San Fernando, San Tao, like the Tao, San Tao, la, 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 and yeah, San Tao, la, yeah. <laughs> you know? I love it, I love it. I think you're overestimating uh everybody's, you know, everyone's kind of like memories of a butterfly. Uh, and uh, yeah, by the Tao, everybody already forgot what was the first thing. You know? yeah, exactly. I said no problem. Well, I, uh, I'm glad to know I wasn't uh, wildly wrong um, and uh, was res- re- relatively close. I've been familiar with your work for a long time, and I thought it would be um, a kind of interesting way to start uh, talking about some of your your work that heavily predates the work in The Last of Us, uh-huh. specifically because you are one of those composers that I think um, m- many, many other composers have this love-hate relationship with, because <laughs> your work is so, uh, it cuts to the heart so effortlessly that um, in particular, your your piece, Iquasu, I yeah. think was in every temp track for about 15 years. Most hated pieces in, 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 in <laughs> cinema because the president of the Composer Society here in Los Angeles, he said, you know, Iwasu is the piece that everybody hates. All the composers hate because they use it in every temp. It, it's between you and um, Thomas Newman of a particular cue from Shawshank. Exactly, yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful uh, kind of wreath to wear around your neck to to be the bane of so many other composers because yeah. it means you managed to create something so authentic and so unique that directors found it utterly irresistible uh, just time and time again and uh, because we've never had the occasion to meet I, I would love to know I, I can draw guesses and I can draw my own kind of hypotheses about. Ron Rocco as a record and, and a, about your process as a musician and as a composer, but I would rather not speak for you. So can you just, I, obviously we'll get to the last of us quickly, yeah. but I want to know 
uh, that that album seems connected to The Last of Us aesthetically and emotionally, and obviously it's youth in both cases very deeply. And what, right. Can you what can you sort of say? I'm sure you've spoken at length over the last twenty years about it, and you're probably well, sick of talking know, about it. If I, would, if, I, if I if I if I spoke about in the, in these terms, I don't know. You know what happened to me? I played a I am. Play guitar since I was five years old, and I I had like formal tuition between five and ten, but never really managed the academic side of uh, music. So by the time I was ten, the teacher quit on me, and you know came to my mom and said his his ear is stronger than my music, and and uh, she quit. And f- then on uh, around ten, huh. I started writing my my first songs and my first stuff. But you know, part of the the techniques probably that I have picking and stuff comes from those five <laughs> those five years at the beginning, you know. But I was always self-taught. I was always very interested in the concept of identity. So I had a band. I started making records in Argentina when I was 16, 17 years old. I did my first album when I was 18. And actually in that album, which has been re-released, it turned 50 years uh, last year. Uh, wow. Uh, in that album is the blueprint of everything that I've done after this. You know, are my songs, my production things, uh, uh, the m- music for movies and the video. Every, everything in a way is, is in that in that album. Uh, the band was called Arco Iris, uh, like Rainbow. You know, and uh, I always at that time I always thought. I mean, we we already knew that we we you know we had to sing in, in our language in, in in Spanish because at the beginning you know with the with you know the the the, the beat and everybody, you know, people were singing in English, but they said, no, we yeah. have, you know, a, a rock and, a, and a, it's something that, you know, people can understand what we want to say, you know, it's important. But then I always thought that we also should play in our own language. And that's when I started really uh, getting more deep into Argentinian folk music and South American folk music, which I've always been very attracted to. Some of the first stuff that I learned, songs that I learned were folkloric songs, you know. So I... And in that search, an instrument that, you know, grabbed my attention was the charango. You know, the charango is an instrument from the Uh Andes Mountains. And then so I I started playing charango, started writing, you know, little pieces in charango when I was probably 15, 14, 15 years old. I had my first charango. And then when when I established the band, I became very popular with this band around, you know, 20 and stuff. I wrote a a rock opera called South America. uh, And uh, and I I started using more and more the charango. And and it always was an instrument that I loved. But then one day, I discovered the ronroco. And the ronroco, it is in the family of the charangos. It is, somebody can tell, it is a charango. It's a lower pitch charango. But in my view, it's an instrument that is very different in many ways the charango. One of them, the main thing is that it has incredible sustain, which the charango doesn't. So the charango, you're, you're going to see players, charango players using a very quick right hand, in which they do a lot of, a lot of, you know. yeah, like a, like a tremolo, like a Spanish guitar, almost kind of like a mandolin, you know, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of with a pick with a hand and, you know, playing chords and stuff. With the ronroco, I found that, and, and there's there's no finger picking. I mean, there is, but very little. Nobody can play a charango or that. At least there's not a culture of somebody playing the charango by themselves. No other instrument doing a comp, you know. You, right. you, they need a guitar or something because, you know, the, the instrument won't stand just the, the, the sustain of the notes, you know. Uh, so in any case, when I grabbed the ronroco, it was like a, discovery a world open to me and i found really something that connected with my soul very deep in that instrument you know those pentatonic scales or you know whatever i mean you know uh, i i i really really connect with that instrument and you know i started recording things just for me i still you know making records producing other artists but just keeping these recordings and, and when i became a very very sort of you know renowned producer in the latin world you know uh, i was contacted to to do a compilation by you know what would be probably one somebody like uh, the ravi shankar of the <laughs> the charango called Jaime Torres, a dear, dear, now he's a dear friend of mine. He passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a master, really. And, uh, and yeah, I was, I was approached to create a compilation of his, and I recently listened to 400 of his recordings, literally. And I, at the time, I wasn't, I had 
tremendous respect for the man, but I wasn't his friend. And I was very, uh, I, I wanted to, to show him what I did, but I was very, very, uh, you know, shy about it. So I gave him, I remember at the time, uh, some music, and I believe even it was a cassette. Imagine, I mean, how long ago was that? I gave him a cassette or something and, and told him that it was music that some friends of mine did. You know, I didn't even want to tell him that it was me. And uh, and uh, he called me three days later. He said, "You are the guy that is playing here. Just tell me, you are the guy that is playing here." So, <laughs> but you know, I don't play with your techniques. I, you know, I really, you know, I was. I just, I thought that perhaps you know, I could be burned. You know, by at this, you know, but because I was sounds doing, like imposter syndrome. Yeah, you know, something you know, playing with finger picking. What is that? You know. And he said, "No, man, you have to, you have to put this out. You know, you have to put this out. You have found." the spirit of the instrument you have to it doesn't matter there's no rules how you play this you know and he really pushed me to put this record on rocco which actually contains recordings that span a period of 13 years of my life so that record has records recordings that i collected from 13 years of my life wow going back to what 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 was the how old were you with the young, with the oldest of those I was, uh, am I, uh, 30, 30, 31, something like that, yes. Yeah. It's, all, it's, it's just so, it's so interesting because it comes across so personal. And obviously the fact that your performance, you know, it's an intimate instrument by nature, you know, it's very different from like an orchestral uh, sound, you know, the, the fact that we're, we're right there with you. It feels like you're sitting next to us while we're listening and, and I think that's one of the differences in my scores too, the fact that I play most of the old, the instruments in them and, and that I'm, there's that presence in there, which is different than when you have, you know, a, a, a musician reading a chair, which I don't have anything against. And I think there's some fantastic music created that way. I'm just saying that it's different, you know, it's a, it's a different uh, vibe and it, and it is personal. It has an element of, uh, it has character you know uh, almost like a presence as an actor but you know in a in a different uh, in a different level you know what i mean yeah absolutely well and in, in the comparison to actors is interesting because there's you know there's some actors that have a certain kind of shtick that they they master and and uh, and then there's others you know like a gary oldman that that are just these unbelievable chameleons that kind of disappear in what they're doing and i think the same holds for musicians and composers, you know, where somebody um, uh, kind of becomes this perfected version of one thing. Correct. Um, and I think a lot of people probably regard you that way, but I actually think that that's, I think that's unfair. Well, but you know, for example, Brokeback Mountain doesn't have one Ron Rocco anywhere. Well, exactly. And, and, and actually there's, there's quite a bit, especially when we broaden out to your world as a producer, it seems like the diversity is actually uh, rather immense, but, but uh, still, I think it's just the nature of particularly Iquasu and just the, how yeah. influential it became. I once met a, yeah. I once met a guitarist uh, at an event in LA who was looking for studio work. And he said, um, he said, I can help you out if you ever need any of that Gustavo thing. That was his exact sentence to me. And uh, I, I remember the funny thing was that I knew instantly what he meant. Uh, and uh, I mean, I hear it lots of times. You know what I mean? I hear the Gustavo thing and, and uh, it, it, you know, it, it brings a smile to my face. What can I say? Oh, well, that's actually, that's, that's great to hear. I was curious what your relationship with that would be. I always wonder the same with a guy like I just don't think that, I just don't think that is the same at all. You know, I just think it's somebody doing Gustavo, but it's not Gustavo. That's well, that's yeah, of course. It's I mean, that's true. There's many instances of that. Uh, uh, even 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 at the far end of the spectrum with someone like Hans Zimmer, that you can always tell the difference between someone attempting to be Hans and Hans. Correct, absolutely. Uh, and uh, but uh, but I'm glad to hear that it it it, it doesn't. Um, bring a frown as opposed to a smile because um oh, it's a smile no no i don't the contrary i mean a way you know what i mean i, I feel it as a compliment you know to to my work of some something that has become uh, valuable and uh, and a style or an approach uh, uh, that that is different and then somehow i've been part responsible for it and it's a it's a it's i take it as a compliment well, I, yeah, I, I, as you should, at least in my opinion, I, I think it, it's something that few musicians or composers in general 
really ever achieve. You know, they're, they're, the idea that like you could say the same of someone like Philip Glass, where Correct. there's a very specific sound. Correct. Um, and, 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 and likewise, well, actually, I would argue you're more sort of diverse in your artistry. I, I, didn't, mean, you know, I, I didn't want to say it because it would look bad, but I think, I think it's, I, I love uh, Philip Glass stuff, but I think he's really in, into that thing. You know, I do many, many things. That's why I mentioned the uh, Brokeback Mountain that doesn't have any Ron Rocco because it's true. Or, you know, I mean, The Last of Us, of course, the main theme I wrote in Ron Rocco uh, and in, you know, in 6-8, which is not a typical North American rhythm, you know, right. uh, uh, but uh, but you know the, the the theme and there's a lot of guitar and now in the in two is there's the banjo too which I knew I was going to play in a different way I mean it's what I in a way I mean what I did in Babel with the oud you know mm-hmm, I mm-hmm. never uh, play an oud I mean that that has to do a lot with with a, 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 a sort of a, a view and a position that I have uh, regarding uh, playing uh, playing and playing instruments. I mean, there's something perhaps, you know, that it's interesting to, to mention. I've said it before in other interviews, but uh, it, that, for example, I find it very uh, attractive to uh, play instruments that I don't know how to play. I love, <laughs> right. I love to put myself in front of an instrument that I don't know, uh, yeah, because I don't consider myself either or a film composer or a video game composer or, you know, I, I consider myself, you know, an artist that do different things in different forums. And uh, and like I said, not an expert really at, at anything, but, you know, but <laughs> with a particular uh, vision, you know, or view. You know, I, I love that in English, you know, when you, you, you perform in an instrument, it's called to play, which is, you know. Right. We in Spanish we hate tocar, you know, it's not as nice as to play. But I like that that playfulness of you know something that you don't know. Uh, so the danger, the childish, and also the minimalistic uh, approach. Because of course, when you don't know uh, an instrument, you know the best thing you can do is try to minimize what you're going to play, and uh, you, and because I also am in a. a, 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 a a fervent uh, promoter of silence. I love mm-hmm. eloquent silences. Uh, I uh, that also puts me in that situation. And uh, and for example, the oud, which is the main instrument in Babel, although there is, although Alejandro wanted to include uh, Iwasu uh, there, and it is in the movie. Uh, but you know, that's the the movie that actually gave me my second Oscar. You know, and and uh, and most of the score is the the oud, and that's an instrument that I never played before, and as you know, is a very difficult instrument because it doesn't have frets and and it, talking about danger. You know, yeah, it's kind of large and unwieldy. But you know, there's there's uh, uh, there is something you know I, again in that, uh, and, and I never played the oud again. I just, <laughs> of course, you know, I knew I was gonna play it not like an oud player, and I think that's the whole thing too. You know, I didn't want to make a, a soundtrack for for uh, Babel. You know, that was a, a, the the soundtrack of a document, National Geographic documentary. You know, I wanted to find an instrument that could connect the stories, and somehow it, the oud it was it was perfect. You know, as an ancestor of the lute, or therefore the guitar. I, I you know I just felt that it was it was a great uh, instrument and it gave me that that thing to play with the silence and to play with the sound and with the banjo in the last of us two is the same thing i'm not you know a banjo player i don't know how to really play the banjo so so that you know lack of expertise it brings something different you know and and really exposes in a way you in a such a human level that that's i mean i really really play with that you know what i mean play with that uh, with that thing but again the emotion it's what i really rely on more than anything you know well there's something that you said that is a wonderful segue you you've you've kind of teed me up beautifully um uh but uh, it's a wonderful kind of connectivity between music and video games where you where you said what you love about in English, the word play uh, and, and all that it brings uh, with regard to music. I've uh, a friend of mine who used to work at Naughty Dog on the uh, Uncharted 
uh, games outside of The Last of Us named Richard Lamarchand once highlighted to me the, the beauty of the fact that even though video games are pieces of software and we refer to all other pieces of software, you know, like Skype or Microsoft Word or something, we always refer to us as using them, but we play games yeah. and playing a game really is a very different verb, you know, and I think the, 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 the notion of the, the kind of the kinship between that and the idea of you playing music or playing an instrument is something yeah. uh, that's a beautiful uh, link between the two that I honestly never really thought about until you said it just now. So with that said, then I'd love to get into, you know, the reason or part of the reason why we're chatting, I, I would have loved to anyway, and I've, I've, I've been familiar with your work for 20 odd years now. Um, uh, but it was, it was a conversation with Neil where he, uh, had, had listened, I think to prior episodes of this podcast and said, you know, you and Gustavo really, I think should, should chat. There's some interesting things to uh, be discovered there. And I think part of what catalyzed that conversation was because I made a video on YouTube where I said, um, here are the reasons why I think I would have been the wrong composer for The Last of Us. And I tried to kind of analyze. I want to see that. I'm sorry I missed that. I no, I, well, I'll send it to you with, with incredible uh, with incredible anxiety. I will send it to you. Um, yeah. And uh, Come on, Austin. Come on. Well, part of, part of it is that I, I took some I took some um, I took some guesses about your process that I would love to find out how right I really was. And the funny thing was that uh, you are you are you really I, I I view you guys you know like I mean the, the you know, like the real composers you know what I mean the real guys I I just you know I mean I I do what I do and I and I, I'm totally aware of the of you know in in a way that that affects people you know in a very strong way but you know i i i can't you know sometimes you know uh, feel that i am in the same you know league that you know you guys in a way you know what i mean i just feel kind of well like- i i think i think you're right but you have the opposite perspective of what that means uh because i i agree we are probably out of your league but uh no 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 what are you saying no 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 no, no you, I appreciate the the spirit with which you mean that, but no, I think no. I think your comments uh, are are spot on. I, I think that your your um, your sort of uh, your your sort of colleague turned uh, friend who led you down the path uh, on the Ron Rocco uh, uh, saying. Um, uh, you know, there's no rules. Uh, yes. I think that that epitomizes all of this uh, rather beautifully. Right. So in that sense, I, I can connect, you know, with that because I, I do think it's like, you know, lots of times I say, why not? I mean, well, no, because there's there's always this pre- prejudice, you know, that people actually impose on themselves of things that you can't do because imagine the masters, what they will say or not. These people really know how th- what they're doing. You don't know, you know. Oh, yeah. I don't. I, that thing, I know that that doesn't doesn't stop me. You know, I I, I go well. You know, I do what I do, and 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 that's it. You know what I mean? I don't. I'm not pretending to be. You know, the other thing. You know, I'm just well. And everybody suffers that that um, and that sort of insecurity. I remember reading once that uh, when Jerry Goldsmith was conducting the recording sessions for Psycho Two, he said, "I'm sure Bernard Herrmann is turning over in his grave right now that 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 I." You know, someone he regarded as essentially a charlatan is uh, is uh, taking up the mantle of his great masterpiece. So I think we all we all worry about the judgment of our of yeah. our ancestors, as it were. I just, um, I, I, I just don't let that really occupy too much time in my. Well, life. I can tell you that the the world of video games is very grateful that you don't let that occupy you because um, for the longest time, games had a little bit of a crisis of musical diversity and partly because you know there were just not that many people making games and it was also you know it was sort of like small pockets in the US very kind of niche industry in Japan it wasn't really a global industry for for quite a few years until eventually it became such and and um, and even still there was always this kind of notion that video game music is either throwback uh, chiptune type electronic music evoking the 80s and early 90s or it's the biggest baddest most Hans Zimmer uh, aspiring orchestral right. and you you so deftly proved everybody wrong and not least of which because of the use of silence which I, I'm so glad you brought that up because that to me the real the sparseness of The Last of Us is 
is 75% of its kind of victory musically. Um, And so one thing I just would love, I'd love to know um, is was the, would you describe the process as you kind of just following your instincts as you always do, or did, did Neil or the folks like Scott Hanau and whomever at Sony, you know, there were a lot of folks obviously at the table involved, but to what extent was it kind of just let's unleash Gustavo to be Gustavo versus um, having to kind of fit in within their vision more prescriptively? Yeah, no, I have to say one thing that I've, you know, every time, you know, I have the opportunity I'd like to mention is that I felt totally free to try whatever I wanted to try. And in a way, I was encouraged to do that. So, uh, yes, of course, I did, you know, a lot more music than what it ended up in the game. And, of course, there are things that probably didn't, you know, didn't, were not what perhaps Neil uh, needed or wanted, and that's part of the process, you know what I mean? But I was never actually uh, demanded or uh, censored or say, no, don't do this, or no, no, not at all. If, if, if something was, okay, no, we're missing uh, something, you know, uh, some attention, or we're missing some, or uh, we love this. Why don't you uh, explore more? I mean, to be honest, I mean, when I when I came up with the idea of the banjo, I was uh, a little bit concerned that you know they might think, oh, you know, that could be you know cliche or whatever. And of course, I mean, I I told them the idea of the banjo, but at the same time, I show them what I had in mind and, 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 and they, they really went for it, which I loved, you know, but that's something to, to show me there. They were totally open and they were very, very, it was, it's just great working with, with Neil and Scott, you know, in, in, in the previous game with Jonathan too. I mean, they're, they're mm-hmm. great, great people to work with. Yeah. So that, I mean, that, that kind of confirms some of my, my assumption that it, it felt, it felt so you, yeah. To the, to the extent that I fully kind of understand uh, uh, you from your from your body of work, that it, it did seem like they wanted you to basically freely explore. But I'm curious about some of those things that didn't make the cut. Um, in, you know, is it the kind of thing where a whole a whole idea went in the trash or was it more like kind of like you alluded to a moment ago, it, you know, this is pretty close, but could it be a little darker or a little more tense or, or whatever? Like, is it variations or were there just huge chunks of things that really just didn't work? No, I don't, no, no, I, I wouldn't uh, say huge chunks of things. No, not, no, 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 it's just that there's a lot of, first of all, there's, you know, there's so much that even, even as, <laughs> as even that is, is true, the fact that, you know, you need tons of music for a video game, you know, still there is a, you know, an amount of music that can be there and, and not, not much more than that. So it has to do also with, with selection and deciding which is the, the best. And also some, some of, of, of the things perhaps, you know, we were not exactly in the right tone, but still they were around. To me, they all somehow are connected, but uh, but no, I never I never felt that it was uh, like a big concept. You know, it was thrown away. No, 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 I never felt that. Do you think that that is because you resonated so much that with the with the idea of the story and of you know this this characters of Joel and Ellie and all of that, or right. was it a function of just them? choosing the perfect composer where your instincts just naturally gelled with, or maybe both. Maybe both. I don't know. I really, I mean, I, I have to say that, uh, that uh, again, I mean, I, I as you know, because I've said many times, I like to work from the, the stories and the characters much more so that just from the scenes, you know, this, this is something that I've done you know, that I do in the world of cinema. So in a way, you know, it wasn't, it was not different for the video game. I mean, as you know, in lots of movies, the composer comes at the very end when the movie's already been cut, tempt with other music, and, and then you have to follow the theme. I hate that. I feel it is totally unartistic in a way. You know what I mean? I, I know that it can be done, and it can be done very well and stuff, you know. I'm just saying personally, 
It's not a way that I like to work chasing a tempo of somebody else or even mine. I I rather you know uh, do music that I feel for the for the whole story and and that I try to cover you know moments of tension and moments you know of of. Uh, you know, of, of reflections and things like that, or, you know, and then have actually the director or, you know, or some other people uh, start thinking where these things could work better. And, and it really ends up working fantastic. I mean, the the biggest example of that is Brokeback Mountain, because the whole score... I was going to bring it up. <laughs> Brokeback Mountain, the whole score of Brokeback Mountain was done prior to one frame being shot. The whole score, the whole, there was nothing that I wrote after... Uh, the film was done, and nothing. It was all, you know, but it was the genius of Ang Lee to say, okay, we're going to put this here, we're going to repeat this here. And of course, then, you know, you, you trim it and you edit it for, for the scene, but, the, you know, the themes, the sonic fabric, you know, the idea of the, the guitar with the strings, the space, the, you know, the pedal steel, you know, which was like, like the, the kind of like the other character, you know, the guitar. Mm-hmm steel and uh, and the silence you know it gave me the opportunity to to work you know with silence which i love and it was fantastic because uh, when uh, when uh, when i sent the music you know i uh, i uh, angly thought that it was something that i was sending um, as an example of stuff that i've done because he didn't know my work, you know, and, uh, and, <laughs> and and he said, damn it, I mean, this music will be perfect for the movie, you know, and the producer said, no, no, this is the music of the movie, and uh, and he played that music to the actors, and he was so kind, and, and, and to say in the early times, you know, that actually he put together the narrative of the movie with the music, the music was helpful for him to, to actually put the narrative of, of, uh, of the movie and uh, well, were you reacting solely to a script or was there anything beyond that and one meeting with ang the script and one, meeting. And one meeting with ang lee yes which you know he's uh, chinese and stuff he doesn't you know talk that much you know what i mean so it was a very we have a you know exchange of ideas about you know the guitar and the strings and that and then i came back to los angeles it was in new york that i met with him i was uh, rehearsing with a friend of mine that Carney Hall for some other stuff. And I got a phone call saying, Ang wants to meet you, you know. And I already read the script by then. And, and uh, and you know, the producer, James Seamus, a great guy, you know, he 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 thought that sometimes he said, you know, I mean, those sinuses, I, you know, you felt that you're, I, I, I was thinking, are you pulling my leg? You know I mean? <laughs> How can you wait so long for another note, you know? But then, you know, I, I remember that <laughs> it's something that I, that now I know because, you know, people use it more, but he talked to me about my negative space, the use of negative space. I didn't even know what that was. You know? So negative space, oh, the silence, yes. Uh, I just, I think that, you know, silence has so much power when it's well used. It's so eloquent. And I, I always said, you know, playing notes, is something easy in a way. I mean, you just practice and you and you even playing fast. You just practice a lot, practice a lot, you'll get it. But not playing, that's harder. You know, not abstaining yourself of saying, no, 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 no. You know, and leaving that space, you know, that that is not the silence that happens at the end of a piece. Because there's silence too, you know, when the, when some uh, conclusion. But it's a silence that is in between something. So it keeps you holding in the air waiting for that other note to come you know and and somehow also i realized that at least at least this is my perception that somehow those silences sometimes can pull people to the screen too you know what i mean there's a there's a something that kind of pulls your your attention or your you know in that sense that leaves you hanging you know there you know oh absolutely i i had composer friend of mine I was more of a mentor a uh, long time ago once said that he felt that, especially with regard to film music, yeah. there's nothing more intense that a composer can use than a pianissimo. Uh, and yeah. I think silence is kind of like the natural conclusion of that. It's like the most intense uh, expression of that would be, you know, niente. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, I, and, and so you, you, you touch on a lot of things. Um, it, I, it's funny. I will confess to you that um, when Brokeback Mountain first came out, and when I was reading about some of your um, 
like basically versions of the story you just told. Yes. I, I, I remembered reading, and part of what I I sort of enjoy is just my I'm always looking for ways to kind of broaden my horizons and learn things and challenge my conclusions and especially if I'm very certain about something being right and then it turns out I was wrong I've come to I've come to love that feeling uh I've come to love that moment of it's like the shell cracking and realizing I've 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 achieved some small form of enlightenment perhaps or at least uh, excitement cuz I'll I'll confess to you when I read about your a- approach to Brokeback Mountain and how incredibly separate you were from the film. Um, I remember saying, look, this is gorgeous music and it works wonderfully, but that can't be considered real film scoring, surely, because, you know, you look to James Horner, John Williams, and I had a very narrow view of what that could mean. And and the thing that enthralled me about their work was they labor over each frame and they say how it, it, uh, your your comments about yeah. temp music i completely agree with but just if we ignore the temp side of it and we right. just say the art of of looking at the footage and kind of dancing with it to me that's what film music was that's a, but that's a, that's amazing too i think it's fantastic it's just not the way i do it but that not, that doesn't well, mean- and that's where and that's where i i owe you a lot of credit for um you know for years i thought ah you know what a what a um like separating the fact that no one can deny that this music is beautiful um uh and 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 heartfelt and soulful and personal but yeah. but i had this big kind of asterisk associated with it with regard to the art of film scoring and then i had this great rude awakening when one of my un uncritically um sort of assumed great masters when i realized he worked the same as you which is of course il maestro Ennio morricone yeah. uh, <laughs> He he never scored to picture either. He and in, in in his great masterpieces, like the Leone westerns, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Fistful of Dynamite, Once Upon a Time in the West, all scored before they shot the film. Okay, so there you go. When I did that, I didn't know that. I just it was my my natural way of 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 doing it. And uh, to to reaffirm that, I mean, there are. I mean, you you are in a way composing inspired by the story. And Absolutely the, yes. The characters and, for example, the use of silence, which I love and I use, you know, in my music. But in that story, plays a role too because those guys they really didn't talk that much between. There was really a, a silence as part of their life. Silence was part of their life too. So in a way, I mean, the, the silence in Brokeback Mountain it also has a text to it. Absolutely. But, with with those guys and the way they actually com- not communicate between them or the you know the the very small communication that they have and the biggest you know spaces of silence and of big nature and that you know that the the the, the, the music that was created for that I, in a way for me reflects that doesn't matter that it wasn't done against a frame you know or a, or, a, or a picture the picture was in my mind. Well, and, and the results clearly speak for themselves, uh, and and The Last of Us is no exception to that. And so it's one of those I, I feel, I feel very gratefully corrected on what was perhaps a an overly narrow view of what the art form's potential is, and and I and I owe you a gratitude for uh, ex- sort of forcing me to confront uh, an assumption that that really had no reason to be an assumption. Just because one person did it one way didn't mean that it couldn't be reconceived and. And I think The Last of Us is is another example where when, you know, I've scored a lot of games and I work very closely with the game typically and the game developers to really try to make the music feel deeply interwoven. And so I wanted to hear more about kind of, um, you know, obviously your process of absorbing the nature of the characters and all that. And The Last of Us is, is, is far more linear than a lot of other games, right? Like we follow the story. Right. Uh, beat by beat in a way that's closer to a film than plenty of other games. Um, but still, to, to what extent did did that did the gameplay, for lack of a better way to put it, did, did that figure into your conversations? Were you truly operating as normal, or did anything kind of come about differently as a result in, in either game? One not part really, one or two. Not really, not really, because uh, th- that. Part I, I guess you know it was more 
taken care by the people at at uh, Naughty Dog and Sony PlayStation to really, you know, and and uh, you know, we work back and forth with you know stems and and you know and and uh, things of that matter. You know, I mean, I I, I remember I was fascinated that you know they they, they develop a, a type of programming which by that just using the stems, you know, you could be in one area for I don't know fifteen minutes and the music will never actually repeat. You know, it would always. Right. You know, I mean, those kind of things really, I mean, f- f- fascinate me. And uh, but that that's all really work that they have to get the credit because I I I, I was just more a spectator in, in in that. You know, I mean, it was more. Uh, I I think I I gave them just you know the the materials, the the sounds, the the you know the the, the, the vision, but but things that are more directly to the game playing. Uh, those things. I mean, I I I, I told you. I mean, I I really don't know i don't know how to play the games you know i'm so bad you know <laughs> did you try did you attempt uh, to play the license <laughs> forget it but, but my son is really really uh, it's it's pretty good it's pretty good and uh, and it's fantastic for me you know to see the impact that uh, that this game, and I, again, you know, I, I I know the impact that games have in in, in general, in you know, for many years that have had in, in, in young people especially, but uh, but this game in particular, you know, the the way it has touched people, you know, is so amazing. I mean, I, I went last year to a video conference in uh, in Kuwait, you know, where mm. alcohol is is illegal, you know, illegal. I mean, you cannot drink and you can't even own a bottle of wine, you know, and, and women, as you know, are totally you not know, covered, but, you know, but the little window, you know, and mm-hmm. they, they play, but they are allowed to play. So you see at the video convention, this, these ladies, you know, come over and, and, you know, you can, you can even imagine, I mean, what, what, that, what window to the outside world can be playing a, uh, a game and how the music, you know, played such an important role in, in the game that people connect with the music in such a uh, emotional and almost spiritual level. You know that I mean, I have people that follow my my stuff, uh, different things. You know, I have people that you know follow my songs and you know know me as an artist from the very beginning. Also, I I play in a in a group that we have through the world and called Bajo Fondo, in which we mix, you know, tango, milonga, candombe with rock and electronics and hip hop and stuff. So I have different sort of fans for for different things. Also, my productions. You know, I mean, I produce Café Tacuba for twenty seven years now, and and you know, and produce many great uh, Latin alternative acts. But the the way the fans uh, connect the for the video game, it's a different thing. It's really it really feels different. Yeah, it is. Well, it's I can I can speak to that because I um, I remember once wondering exactly that thing where I, I said you know in general, even though the game industry has. Um, a greater economic reach already than both film and and the music industry combined. Far more people see movies still than uh, than play games. Like a, a a big Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie or something yeah. will, be, will be seen by hundreds of millions of people. A single title, a single two hour movie, and very very few games ever come close to those numbers of players within that one game. Uh, you know, like a huge hit game like The Last of Us, you know, you're talking, you know, 10, 15 million players over the span of a life as it constitutes a huge hit. So it's still a, a much smaller population overall. But the difference yeah. is, you know, a game like The Last of Us is, you know, 20 hours, give or take. I say to folks, how many of you have listened to your favorite album by your favorite band or favorite artist for 20 hours or, or in some games, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 hours you could call something your favorite album of all time and only have listened to it for 10 hours worth and still f- stand on that conviction. Game music, we we get to share this experience for a much longer period of time, even within one title. And so we have like this, it's like an unfair advantage in my mind. Uh, it's true. And also the fact that people get invested in this particular game also get emotionally invested. Yeah. And that- that's what, 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 what it is. I mean, it really sets a big difference. And there's something very kinetic as well. You know, if I'm playing The Last of Us and I'm, you know, I don't even think of me as playing the character of Joel, but it's more like I'm sharing a moment with Joel. But that's a whole other conversation right. about the unique design of those games. But um, 
I'm in a moment with Joel and then I walk through a door and then the sound, you know, your music comes through the, because I walked through the door. There's something very magical about the fact that I, it's like I, my action brought your music into the moment. Uh, and I think that also gives players a very heightened, not just awareness, but, but, but like love, it's like seduction. Uh, the, the music, you become so attached to it. And so it becomes so part of your experience. It's, it's, it's true. It's true. It's true. It's just, it's that it kind of. Yeah. It's very, it's very personal. You know, it's very intimate. Very personal, very personal. Were there ever any times where you saw the way that this music was being implemented in the game? Like, as you said, you were somewhat of a spectator. So is there, were there any times where you saw like some footage of the gameplay and thought that was maybe not how you would have used that music or, the, or how like they, they kind of created a relationship that was unexpected? No, not that I remember. No, no. I, I thought it was very appropriately used. No, no, it never happened. Oh, well, that's always, not, I, I, that's always kind of my fear. I think with, uh, with working, if I, if I were to kind of fully, um, embrace a, a style of, of approach like yours, I think my fear would always be, you know, something was created so with so much love for moment X and then it got used in moment Y instead and I'd have a hard time seeing it objectively. Yeah, but but it's more, in my case, I mean, I just, it's more abstract in a way. And I, 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 I in a way, I mean, I enjoy diversity I, I enjoy you know do, do, doing something in a different way even of something that i conceived you know sure so uh, well out of curiosity about your about that conception process you know one of the one of in that video i mentioned where i i said i would be the wrong composer for the game one yeah. of my um one of my hypotheses about your way of working that i think from what we're saying here today and what, what you're mentioning feels like is probably correct is it feels not necessarily improvised, but there's so much about your writing that feels like it's being born in the moment where you kind of are trying to go to some very personal place emotionally and then express that in a very real time sort of way, as opposed to the kind of, you know, that stereotypical image of like Mozart sitting there and or Beethoven, you know, writing pencil and paper where it's there's nothing, there's nothing performative. You can imagine for somebody that doesn't know how to read or write music, my process it has to do a lot with me searching. I mean, with my, my way of notation, it is recording. Right. So, so in a way, when I'm writing something, you know, and, you know, sometimes, you know, it happens before I hit record, you know, that I, I look for, but, but there's always that immediacy of something that was created, you know, very fresh, uh, and that is that is sort of coming out of the instrument, you know, through this connection with, you know, with, with the energy, you know, with the source. And uh, I am a true believer in the 80% perspiration, 20% inspiration. <laughs> so I, 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 you know, I'm not wait, sit down in a couch waiting for the light bulb to turn. You know, I, I work and eventually I connect and then things start happening. But, and, uh, and that's why, for example, I mean, I love, uh, Another things to add to the to the instruments that I don't know how to play are mistakes. I love mistakes. I love uh, uh, story, yeah, those, those real time moments. And those happen, you know, there, you know, because you still don't know exactly the piece, and and uh, you know, I'm just looking to, you know. So there's a little bit of that too, and and, uh, and sometimes mistakes are just mistakes, but sometimes, you know, like I think Brian, you know, said, you know, there are hidden intentions. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, you know, it's, it's that thing that you will never have done. And then, but, you know, I always pay attention to the mistakes because I've, I found in lots of them, great things that I have immediately incorporate to the, to the piece. And I have a, a fantastic story that happened when I came here to, to this country, you know, in 1978. Uh, I, I came, you know, with, you know, and I was writing uh, songs, you know, uh, and, and put together. So out, of, out of curiosity, just as a brief pause, did you come straight from Argentina or did you live somewhere else in between? I did. I came from Argentina. I came in, in the worst 
decade in Argentina where 30,000 people disappeared at the hands of the government. And I was put in jail since I was four, 15, 16 years old, many times, just for wow. two, three days at the most. I was never hurt, thank God. But but uh, but I've seen people got hurt. I, I have friends and disappeared, you know, disappeared supposedly, you know? Yeah. Uh, so it was impossible to keep for me. It was dangerous for me to stay there. And uh, so I, I, uh, I came and, and, and uh, I, I uh, distributed, I remember, some cassettes with, with songs of mine and stuff. And no, no reaction whatsoever. But a guy reacted, you know, from a publishing company. And so we got together. I play, you know, guitar, with my songs with the guitar. We listen to the tape. And you know, at a certain point, he said to me, well, you know, it's great, you know, it's stuff at you is fantastic, but you know, your songs are great, but there's a moment that you always seem to hit the wrong chord, the wrong note. There's something <laughs> you, know, you seem to hit, everything is going great, and suddenly, boom, you seem to hit the wrong note, the wrong chord. I said, well, probably this means we're not going to work together, but what you're telling me, I take as a compliment because I am <laughs> for that note, you know. Many years after, I ran into this person. He didn't obviously remember. He's a very important person. It's a publisher of a big artist, you know. Uh, and somebody introduced me to him. And he knew, oh, you're the guy from the Oscars and stuff. I said, no, no, you don't remember me. Many years ago, I came and, yeah, and you, you had an office here and stuff. The guy was like, really? You know, he was, remember, he didn't remember me, but he knew that I knew who, that the office and everything. So I said, you told me this. And you know what? I think people now love that, that wrong note, you know? I've always been looking for that wrong note, that, that wrong chord, that thing that kind of like moves the balance, you know? And sometimes it's just with the silence, sometimes it's with emotion, sometimes it's with the noise of a guitar. That's why I like to keep all the noises in there. Yeah, yeah you, and I've noticed that you, it's very uh, close mic to an extreme in many cases where every last, it's like you can hear every atom of your fingers. All right, I love that, you know. I love also the, the 60 cycles, you know, sometimes or the whatever cycles of the amp. I mean, I like all those those textures, those things that lots of people, and, and I have, this is a true story. Somebody, I'm not going to say where, but uh, once asked me for the noises, you know. I mean, I was doing a piece, and what are the noises? Obviously happen when they happen, but it's not something that I'm doing it, you know, on purpose is, you know. And say, but I want the noises that you have in the in the stuff that you do with the, the Gonzalez in too. You know, I don't go in. I mean, those noises happen. It's not, but they were asking me for the noises of oh, things. That's very funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I will release the um, the Centaulaya uh, sample library of all neck slides and uh, all the all the wrong things. Yeah, exactly. The library of the wrong notes. Beautifully know? broken, we'll call it. Uh, and uh, well, so that actually, that 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 um, fascination and uh, appreciation for the wrong notes. Um, Imperfection of life, which is right. Life is like that. It's not, you know, it, 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 chem pure, you know, chem chemistry. You know, it's not, you know, what I mean. It sounds very, uh, you know. Nazi, you know what I mean? It's a chemically perfect world. No, no, you know, it's no, the world has imperfections and that's what makes it beautiful too. Oh, I couldn't agree more. I, I, um, I, th those, an openness to those happy accidents is something that has, uh, always been very, um, meaningful and important to me in, in my own process, even if the process itself is very different from yours. Um, right. and, uh, and so I, I love hearing that. And, and but going back a moment to your, um, you know, the eighty percent perspiration. I, yeah. I've always loved that outlook, and I've I've heard that quote before, and I've always, right. you know, I've, I resonate with that. And so for 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 a tune, literally, this I'm sitting. I don't know if it's audible, but for a tune like this, you know, uh, from The Last of Us, is that something that you sat there iterating and chiseling and 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 finding it uh, because it's so it's so simple in the best in the best way. It's not simplistic in like a you know uh, childish way. Something like that, you mean? Yeah, well, I, I like your version better than mine. Uh, but it is it, the instrument speaks to me. You know? So well, my specific question, because that's so clear. This is only pre pressuring one fret in the instrument. So, you know, still pressing one. 
okay? The instrument talks to me because of the tuning. It's like the instrument has all those, um, for me, the melodies are, are here. I just have to take them out, but they're, they're, in, they're in there, you know? Yeah, I've always, that's another great sort of, I once spent a lot of time with a painter and we always would have these conversations about, uh, she was my cousin, yeah. uh, uh, you know, deeply, just a very deep soul. And we always talked about the great art feeling discovered and not made. Uh, and I feel like you're, you're kind of saying a similar thing. Um, and it, it, but it actually raises an interesting question that this, forgive that this is kind of a, a nerdy, musically technical question, but um, in my mind, the tune of, of, that, of those notes, this ba -da -ya -da -dum, oh, I've yeah. always heard that as the theme, as it were. But hearing you play it, the kind of arpeggios below seem inseparable from it. And I'd, I'm just out of curiosity, in your mind, is 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 the tune separate from how you play it, or is it just one entity? Well, I think in a way, the the mother, you know, the mothership, it is all together. It's like you know, with the arpeggio and the melody. When it is a ronroco piece, when it yeah. comes out of the into the ronroco. And then, obviously, I mean, it can be arranged and turned into other uh, other things. But but it was it is uh, uh, the I think it, that's the way the pieces was conceived. Yes. Yeah, the pure yeah. form of it. Correct. But it has to, for me, to be valuable. Has to stand by itself. Also, it has to be the harmony and the melody. Something that actually, you know, you could play in a piano or in a guitar. And I've seen beautiful versions done with other instruments of the theme. Oh, there's innumerable uh, uh, examples. Not least of which I was in the audience in 2018 at Royal Albert Hall when Sony did the PlayStation in concert, and they gave it a rather dramatic orchestral. Um, uh, take which, which to me, funny enough, I wasn't actually super crazy about it because it felt so, it felt so at odds with the spirit of of the of the point. Um, Probably became much more standard. That's all, you know. Uh, because, yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. It it it, it kind of it kind of mainlined it in a way. Um, but another question for you then is, you do hit this what I always thought of as a blue note. Uh, yeah. Uh, and I know, I know. yes, exactly. It, now, is that in your mind? Is that one of these wrong notes? It, it, uh, could, it could be totally. It never, it never felt wrong to me, but I always did wonder where that came from. If there even is an exp if there, or if it's just spontaneous, it just came out. No, it it, it, it came out, but, but but it came out. But for me. That was the connection with the blues and with the Americana, because I was using an instrument that it doesn't come from, you know, this culture. And I, I'm very aware that we're doing a game, you know, that is in a, I mean, dystopian in North America. I say North America right. because where I grew up, they told me that America was a continent divided in North America, <laughs> Central America, and South it's America. It's funny that my, my girlfriend is Costa Rican, and she always hated the idea that America means United States. Yeah, yeah because we are American. We are American. Yeah, America is a, is a big continent. So yeah. I knew that for, for uh, in North America, the instrument, the ronroco, is an instrument that comes from the from the south uh, of, the, of the planet and from the south of this continent. And... Uh, and they we're doing it in a in a rhythm that you know it's a six eight uh, rhythm, uh, so I wanted to f connect it with something that and that g g gave me the blues note. You know what I mean? The the bluesy thing that it was that that could be. You know. So you were consciously searching for something to give it one foot in a a, a North American sensibility, a little flavor of that. Yeah, I don't know. You know this. You know the 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 process. This, the speed of the thinking process, how it was, you know, that I was, you know, meditated for it, you know, two days, I need to do this. I just, you know, I knew that I was doing the theme, the music for this theme. And I, I loved what I got the time. And, and then, you know, just, bang, I said, this is it. The blues, the American, this is perfect. You know? So I, 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 I knew that somehow I had to bring it, but it's not that, I was specifically had an agenda to look for that. It just happened all together, you know, at the same time, it's hard to separate one moment from the other, you know, it just happened there. 
Yeah, no, I feel that that in, in, in that video, I've, I keep mentioning that was part of my, you know, my conjecture was that it, it your artistry uh, seems to be about, you know, f trusting your intuitions. Correct. Uh, that's it comes across that way, because one of the big claims that I made in my video was that you um, you, you don't follow that kind of traditional composer model of outlining a bunch of different themes and finding different ways to evolve them and change them and make them grow into new themes or something as a way to kind of follow the characters. Um, and, and, and I got a very, uh, very p polite message from uh, some folks at Sony saying, actually, there actually, there is quite a bit of thematic development in the score that we think you missed. And I was delighted to, to learn that, um, because and then maybe it's the, the the deceptive nature of the silences um, and 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 how kind of poignant they are. But I would love to just ask you directly: Do you think in those terms, in, like a theme for you know Joel and Ellie or whatnot, and then try to kind of evolve them, even if away from the game? No, I don't think in those terms. No, no. And also, like what happens to me too is that I try to, to sort of, you know. In a way, I mean, I'm, I don't know, uh, lots of things now I can articulate in words that I couldn't when I was younger, you know, because I mean, now with so much, you know, under the bridge, you know, I can, I can, I can really express sometimes in words things that, that before it was just intuition and stuff. But that, you know, is uh, something special, but I want to try to, uh, sometimes I, I just feel that, that everything is one theme in a way is the combination of the the sonic elements and the notes and stuff and in a way it's like you know you're listening to to one theme even if they're different you know there's there's one thing that kind of like unites or at least parts of it you know what i mean there's like a one banjo thing you know one ron rocco thing that that will you know so it's not necessarily, you know, addressed to a particular character or this. I, I, I think it, it's much better for me to try to do that with the director, to try to see, okay, this, what would you think? And, and then, yeah, of course, then I can have my input and stuff, but I leave it more to what the director feels because I know I'm feeling all these things. And perhaps if I try to really start putting it a limit and framing them, you know, or no, but this is not perhaps for Ellie, this is perhaps for this, you know what I mean? And then it took me a long time, but but finally, for example, I, I could understand that the, the Ron Rocco had this feminine element that could connect perfectly with Ellie. Mm -hmm. And the six string bass, which I use in the first game uh, substantially, you know, uh, like all gone, you know, and things like that, you know, uh, or, 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 you know, uh, uh, and which I replaced in the second by a, a guitar that is stranged with these strings that they only make in Argentina that are an octave lower of a guitar. So it really works like the, the, the six string bass, the Fender six string bass, you know, not mm -hmm. the, the basses that have 12 strings, you know, and you don't know right. not a bass anymore, but the old <laughs> six string Fender six string bass, which is actually an, an octave lower than than a guitar, you know, and I re and I thought, well, you know, this really connects with Joel and with, with more, you know, sort of a male viral, uh, viril, uh, you know, uh, yeah, sure. thing, you know, and so all those things, you know, it got clear to me after, but but they really make sense, you know what I mean? They make sense. This they so it's kind of like you're you're like stepping outside of yourself and analyzing those choices. Uh, after the fact correct after following my instincts without right. without questioning them and without getting myself too much in the middle you know what i mean I have you ever had that sorry go ahead you know i tried to stay out of the process in a way you know what i mean i just tried to be as uh, transparent to what i'm 
receiving, you know, and just letting it happen without starting, you know, immediately starting to put frames to it. Oh, this should be for Joel. This should be this for this scene or this should be. No, this, I mean, this is, I read the story again, you know, I connect with the character, sympathize, and I just start writing, you know, and see what what comes out, you know, what instrument my hand go to. Okay, this, boom, the guitar, no, the banjo, no, the Ron Rocco, no, you know, and, and then I started to think, okay, why this happened? Why this happened? I'm you, you, you follow me? Oh, absolutely. It, it's it's funny. It's sort of it's like gives me an existential crisis because I, I work so differently and I, I, I find it honestly very inspiring. And I, I'm going to uh, kind of give myself a personal challenge on on some upcoming project to try and uh, create that way to see what happens, because I really do, in a way, almost work the opposite of that. Uh, it was so funny because, you know, I mean, we did a, a talk with John Williams, you know, which uh, it, it was, you know, the the, 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 the Oscar that, that, that I was, the first Oscar with the Brockback Mountain, I was competing with, with John, you know, I mean. Yes, was, on Memoirs of a Geisha. Yeah, you know, the most nominated guy. I mean, he has five Oscars and has been nominated millions of times. <laughs> There's always been that comparison. I mean, you know, in people and in, you know, in critics and stuff, you know, like, you know, this, me is like the anti John Williams, you know, I mean, here's John Williams with 60 people, 90 people orchestra, and there's a guy with a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, that, 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 funny enough, that has happened before, uh, in terms of Oscar, shall we say, controversy when, um, Louis Bakalov, uh, uh, right. achieved a similar situation against James Horner and Braveheart with, uh, Il Postino. Right. Correct, correct. Um, and uh, well, we did a talk organized by the Academy, and uh, it would be Gustavo Duhamel, my friend, also was was part of it. And uh, and it was funny because, you know, we started talking about how we work with the press and stuff, and John explained how, you know, everything, again, like you said, you know, the frame and the importance of this and that. <laughs> I had to say, you know, I worked totally in a different way. I really don't look at anything. I like to read the script, and talk to the director, and just get it from there, start from there, you know? Uh, so it's, yeah, it is a, it's, a, it's a different way to do it, but I think, it, I mean, it, it, it if it works, you know what I mean? If, if oh, it, it clearly does. Connecting with the people, that's the most important thing, that it is, uh, you know, and, and obviously, I mean, all these things that also we tried, which is not to be, uh, you know, over, you know, just just not not to really. I mean, you you're always as an artist, you are somehow manipulating the audience, you know. But you know, you just don't want to feel manipulated. You know what I mean? That's, well, the that's way, yeah, it's an interesting sort of line of thought. That the way I've always thought of it in terms of or my goal is not so much to manipulate the audience in in that. I will make them feel something that oh, yeah, it was yeah. foreign to them. It was more like I'm inviting them into an emotion that was already there, but maybe quiet and, and you're kind of exposing it. And so they're having yeah. it, something genuine inside themselves. You didn't force something external. Oh, yeah. Correct. And of course, with the directors that I worked and stuff, they are all very aware of this. You know what I mean? Not to to you know to 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 make the people say say now you have to feel sad. Now you have to right. <laughs> And, and one of the things that I uh, that I uh, now I'm able to kind of like uh, uh, semi articulate, you know, is uh, because I try to find out what is that connects with people of what what I do, you know, you 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 question why what what, what is it? and and um, and I think it's a quality that sometimes uh, I it comes. It's not something that I do it that I have a an agenda about, but it just comes out that way, and I think connects with a sort of a deep uh, existential anguish that is uh, something that happens to us when we are born, actually. Since we are born, that we sort of uh, are separated from something really huge. And now we are a universe in ourselves. But at the same time, we know that we are a part and we're looking to complete that, uh, you know, uh, that universe with, you know, with a, with friends, with a, with a, with a partner, you know, uh, with, a, with a, you know, your wife or whatever, you know what I mean, or a spouse. Uh, and, uh, and it's something that you, it's a feeling that you can experience even in moments that you are very very happy. Not only yeah. when, you're, when you're very happy too, you know, it's that, that little, 
Melancholy. There's probably there's probably a German word for exactly yeah, yeah. what you're describing. Yeah, yeah. Like Gestalt, something like that. Okay. Yeah, there there always seems to be those very emotional specific okay, right. We have to find that word. Yeah. But, but I know the feeling you're describing and and, and thing, you know, that, that is not it's not sad, it's not happy, it's not but it's very emotional, it's very connected with that that longing that we all have deep in our souls. And I think that, that's part of what I think uh, can, you know, can touch people's music in a different way than it was just, if it was just sad music, you know what I mean? Or if it was just uh, happy music or, or whatever, you know, it's something a little bit different. And I think Tubbs, like I think like Iwasu, is that what is it Iwasu? Is it a happy piece? Is it a sad piece? What is, what you know, what feeling really evokes Iwasu, you know? Yeah, it's a, that's a, that's a beautiful um, kind of uh, like you're shining a light on a, on, a, on a beautiful concept that, that if we think of life in terms of color, the primary colors, you know, pure red, pure blue, those don't exist in the real world. Everything is these shades between. Right. And I think you're right. Like true happiness is something that really only exists in a textbook or like on a Hallmark card or something and the real world. And, and maybe that's also, I think, what c helps people connect so much with this music in The Last of Us is that the game can be ferociously dark and violent. Correct. And there's, there's, there's something beautiful, you know, or like Ellie, one of the, it's so beautifully written and performed by, yeah. by Troy and Ashley where they can be very funny even in a very light, gentle way in the midst of something just horrible. And, and your music has that quality, I think. It's never... It's never this just like epic darkness. Uh, it's, yeah, it is. It's, it's absolutely. Is that what connected you to? Because uh, so, something I meant to ask before when you were talking about kind of your general choosiness. Yes. You know, you said other games have. A, I'd be very curious if you feel at liberty to say what other games well, you. Well, have. I, can, I can. I can. But let's right, say fair, fair enough. It's by American companies and by French company too, too. You know. Yeah. F uh, so fair point. Uh, unsurprising. So so um um. What made this feel different from those? Well, first of all, I mean, I deal with many artists since very, very early age. I've been, you know, around quite a bit and dealt, dealt with great artists. All the, the artists that I've produced, all those 100 albums, they're not yes people. You know, they're all artists with big visions and, and people that actually I had to work my myself to, to gain the their confidence to do my job as a producer and they will go from a you know hardcore you know uh, uh hip-hop rock band like molotov to the chronos quartet so you know very big 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 thing uh, but so i i can distinguish i think you know uh talent some and when i met neil i i thought this guy is really in a way in a way in a particular way it's not that they're similar but it remind me a little bit of like a young gonzalez Iñárritu, you know like uh -huh. Alejandro, you know uh, so um i i think uh, neil has truly uh, some uh, genius uh uh, behind him and and his his whole vision is is amazing. I mean, what he did with the second game that is like so incredible. I couldn't agree more. The fact that the, at certain point after you being invested, you know, uh, for a whole game in Ellie, and then for most of the second game in Ellie, at a certain point, you know, just turn around and you start playing with actually her enemy, the the person that she's been, you know, going at. You know, and that also you are part of that moral dilemma because, you know, I mean, the father was a doctor, you know, got killed, you know, all that stuff. But now, you know, that that you are playing with her. And, and I remember because my son, when my son was playing it, I just walked by and he was already playing with Abby. And, and I said, oh, you're playing with Abby. Yes, I, I just started. I hate her, she said. You know? <laughs> but I passed away hours later, you know. So, so, so how are you doing? Oh, no, it's it's different, feels different now, you know, and the uh, fact that you start, like, you know, seeing, putting yourself in the shoes of another one and start seeing yourself now from the other side, that's like, it's deep, it's deep, man, and, and I think, it's I mean, true. it's a, it's a, it's an emotional ambition that I don't know, I could, I don't think I could name any other game that aspired to such difficult empathy to, to, yeah. to identify with someone that you are programmed to hate. 
And and what it is is that because going to to your your, your comment, uh, it is extremely human. It is that's one of the things that makes the last of us what it is because it is so real, so like life is. You know, I was really, I mean, you know, make me laugh. The people, you know, that was a, they were upset because you know, like in the ten min first ten minutes of the second game, you know, one of the main characters got killed. You know, it was like I mean, it's life. I mean, these are stories, real stories. Anything Thing can happen in life. I mean, how can you open yourself to you know to you know to ev- everything that is in this game, which is unbelievable, you know? And and uh, so I think that one of the the thing that makes the last of us what it is is that it's truly a very human human game, you know. And the music I think has that, that role, that personal human feel that that makes it even more real, you know. Oh, undoubtedly. Um, I, I'm, I'm conscious of your time, and I don't want to abuse your generosity. Um, uh, a, pleasure, a pleasure talking with you about this, because, you know, I know you, you're you a fantastic composer yourself. I've been, you know, I'm checking some of, of, of your stuff, and it's truly amazing. I mean, amazing job. And you're one of the ones that, you know, that know how to sit in front of an orchestra and you know and write them and do that and and it's it's great to share these thoughts with well, like. you you're you're very kind uh, that's a very generous thing to say and and you know what's very funny is um right as we sat down i i took a glimpse at my twitter and literally the moment we started talking somebody wrote on twitter they they took a photo of the poster of the last of us and they said i dare you to name I, I'll, I'll quote their tweet directly here. They said, name a game with a better and more memorable soundtrack you cannot uh, of, with The Last of Us as the as the art. And someone replied, the way I saw this was because someone tagged me and says, you know, that's easy. I give you Journey uh, by by Austin. Which well, is the game. And then what's hilarious is they then start arguing back and forth about, about the, right as we started talking, which was very funny. I, I, I will say, though, I, I happily yield uh, that uh, quote competition, but I thought it was very funny that it, that tweet appeared instantly. It's like the universe, uh, you know, was setting us up. Um, very, yeah. very funny to me. Very uh, funny. But um, uh, yeah, there's so many things I would be thrilled to, you know, because I saw your name show up uh, in the context of um, the Eindemar, uh work of Osvaldo uh, Golyov. Of course. Uh, and, I produce a, a, an album with those Yeah, guys. and that was a connection I never knew existed until a few years ago when I picked up that opera. Aire, which actually contains a couple of my compositions. I mean, the work Aire of Osvaldo contains a couple of my compositions, Suelta de las Cintas y Luna. Suelta de las Cintas sang by Don Upshaw. That's part of Aire, yeah. and it's uh, my compositions. And I, well, and that's the thing. You take someone who's so entrenched in the classical operatic world as like Don Upshaw, and, and to see your name, and that, that was one of those things that over the years I've come to appreciate about your work and everything that you're saying has today has been validating that, that guess of mine, which was that you, uh, and I relate to this very much, I, f- I find, I find uh, your, it's very inspiring that you, you seem to, music is kind of like the ship with which you explore the world. If I may, if I may, very nice. I never thought it that way. I always say I'm an artist that explores in different. I I, I always make an analogy with soccer, with f- football, for us. <laughs> because I said sometimes you know yeah, I'm, I'm I'm in the front and I'm scoring goals. Sometimes I'm in the middle of the field, just you know organizing the game. Sometimes I I'm the goalkeeper or in defense. Sometimes I'm the coach and I'm right. sometimes I am the massage doing. It. But I'm always in, <laughs> I'm always in the game. I'm always in the game, and the game is music you know well it shows in your work i there's a there's a traveler quality to it that is beautiful because you you retain yourself that's the thing you never stop being you but yet you can feel this explorational quality which i um i think is very that's part of maybe what makes it so human very kind of you to to say and i I appreciate because that's in a way that's the way i i feel i feel like uh i mean i one of my big I mean, hits and, and uh, the song is called Ando Rodando. It's a, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm rolling. And it's a song about, you know, just traveling and moving around the world. And, you know, which I've, I've done, I mean, uh, uh, up to now because of this, I was traveling six months out of the year around the world, you know, playing, performing, doing talks, mm-hmm. uh, 
all, all kinds of things. I love people. I love the world. I love our planet. And, and, uh, and I, and, and there's, you know, there, there's no, no I, I like to think that there's no really, uh, nothing that I would, wouldn't like to attempt. If I feel like I wanted to, to try it, why not? Why, you know, I couldn't agree more. Well, I have one final question. Okay. Uh, if you would, uh, if I may be so bold, um, I'm just very curious because you are in a very unusual position now with um, Craig Mazin and HBO saying they want to tackle their own version of The Last of Us and approaching you to do the music. Correct. Having to, well, actually, I shouldn't. I shouldn't assume anything. Is it your goal to? find a fresh new way to approach it? Will you find yourself returning to the existing material? Or do you know yet? I, I know it's still quite early. I don't know. And if I knew it, probably I wouldn't be able to tell you because they are so... Well, that's certainly fair. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but I'm totally honest with you. I don't know. So, I mean, that's a, what I know is that Neil wants to work with me in this project and I would love to continue to work uh, with Neil and who, you know, whatever Neil, whoever Neil wants to me to, to, to work with, uh, I'd, I'd, I'd love to, you know, and, and we'll see, we'll see what, what is it, you know, I know it's, it's, it's the last of us. So, uh, although, you know, it's going to be a different media and stuff, it's still the last of us. And, and, exactly. You know, it's an interesting challenge uh, to kind of be new and yet not. Do I'm used to because I do, you know. I mean, Narcos Mexico, and I, you know, uh, did Jane the Virgin. I mean, uh, experiences on 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 TV, right? I wasn't somehow involved in uh, uh, Hell on Wheels. You know, I did the theme, main theme, and sort of sure. the 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 idea, the concept for the music. And uh, I'm doing now, you know, several shows for Netflix, for Amazon, for. Uh, for Hulu, so I, I let's say that I have some practice and I have some people in my in the team because for this also in a way I mean I work with with uh, other people too. Uh, so I guess you know that part because it is a different uh, a different uh, protocol to do music for a TV series, you know. Uh, that, undoubtedly, yeah. And uh, so, so we'll see. We'll see. I'm very excited, and and I really would like to uh, always would like to try new new things because that's in my nature. But the only thing that I can tell you is that I would like to always try and try to find new things that I can add to what we have. You know what I mean? It's uh, uh, something also that I take in my life too. You know, I'm I I I don't like very much the concept of uh, sort of finishing with something, and you know, like. Like, oh, you know, that was when I was young, you know what I mean? But that, you know, right. I said, oh, no, yeah, that was, you know, that I left that behind. I mean, I, I tried to keep, you know, my little kid with me, in, you know, <laughs> my, you know, the young boy, you know, the, the, the young man. And, and you know, the man. I just like to keep on adding those new faces in my life to what I already have. I, you know, and it took me uh, a lot of guts to to not lose that because I had really very hard times the first eight years that I came to this country. You know, I mean, it was very, very, very hard for me, very tough. Uh, but finally, you know, things started to happening and, and, you know, and here I am. Uh, but I've never twisted. I never went out of my vision of what I want to do. When I get asked sometimes, you know, what would you recommend to a young composer, to a young musician, what, you know, and I always mention the 80% perspiration thing yeah. perspiration so a work ethic i always there's three three things that the second one is finding your own voice finding your identity who are you going to be in this world doing what you do you know being music or acting or whatever you know who who, who are you your identity your sound your and then the third one is stick to it once you have your vision of you know just don't you know because lots of times you get you know you can be sidetracked and lots of people say well i'm going to do this now but because you know but then i'll do because you know and and sometimes you know it's tough because you need to to eat and you need to survive and this problem can happen also when you're very successful because you can have very lucrative offers put in front of you especially when you want to oscars you know it's a get me the oscar guy you uh -huh. know <laughs> and they don't even know what you have done or what you're, you know, you're thinking. Yeah, I'm sure. It has happened to me, you know. And then, you know, you, you, you know, in my case, you know, you turn it down. You said, I mean, you know, I mean, I, I arrived to this place 
having a, a way of doing things and, and connecting with things, I can't do something that I can't connect with, you know? Do you think that that was a wisdom from that part of your life? Like if the Oscar situation had happened when you were younger and then those offers appeared, do you think you might have uh, reacted differently? Probably. Could have been. Could have been. I think there's something also that has to do with what you learn in your home and in your house. I mean, I've seen people getting recognition and become assholes. I mean, I've, I've yeah. seen a lot in, you know, in those many years to be in this business, you know, and with sometimes with very little achievements, you know, and I never understood that. I mean, what was, what is the reason, you know, to become a jerk, you know, uh, because actually, you know, people are connecting with what you do. Uh, so, but I, I will say that also, like, to, to be honest, I mean, you know, when I got I, my first Oscar, I, I took it, of course, of my work for uh, Broke Out Monday, but I took it as a, uh, as a, an award for my life work, for everything that I've done, mm -hmm. starting in Argentina, coming to this country, you know, doing everything. It was like, in a way, you know, an award to all of that. You know what I mean? I, I, absolutely. It reminds me of the famous, pro probably not true, story of someone approaching Picasso and saying, uh, can you make me a drawing on this napkin? And he draws something in two seconds and hands it to them. And, and he says, that'll be a million dollars. And they say, uh, but it took you two seconds. He says, it took my entire life. Absolutely. It's just like that. It's absolutely. Yeah, it's well, it shows. Uh, Gustavo, this has been an absolute joy. I thank you so much for the generosity of your time. Uh, uh, you know, well, so many... Anytime, man. And let's be in contact. You know, I'd love to know more about your music and... And just uh, you know. <laughs> well, hopefully, some occasion can arise where we can make music together. Because I, uh, oh, that'd be fun. I would, yes, I would love to get. Are you a keyboard player? I am. Yeah. Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> I uh, yes, I I uh, I mean, you know, I don't. I, I've always been most comfortable as a conductor, uh, but I I can my fingers know their way around a little bit. Yeah. And, uh, if they don't know the way, it can even be better, you know. Yeah, well, that's the thing. You, you, you were speaking to me very directly when you were talking about trying instruments that you don't know and letting it kind of find something new. And I, yeah, I loved it. Now, this whole thing has been an absolute uh, joy. I'm sure folks will uh, love listening to this. And and um, and just uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Austin. Any time. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us for the Game Maker's Notebook. For more information on the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences, our podcasts, and our other initiatives, please visit www.interactive.org.